Amen. Thanks for leading that song, Scott. Actually, if you were walking outside my house last night, about 8 o'clock, you would have heard my family of four singing that song at the top of our lungs. It's become one of our favorite songs. And we were really excited last night because we, we all try to hold that last note out for really long. And my two girls held that note for the longest they've ever held it. So it was a, it's a big deal in the Brookman household last night. Last night. Uh, and thanks, I don't know where Scott went, but thanks for also leading the song, song before that. It's an important weekend, a memorial day. In fact, just a few weeks ago, I was, I was driving uh, in L.A., and I, and I drove right by the L.A. National Cemetery. It's one of those cemeteries where there's just thousands of, of graves marked by crosses. And it's always interesting to drive by those uh, because it really does make you remember. It makes me remember uh, just how many people have, have served this country and, and given their lives for it. So make sure this weekend to, to be grateful. Uh, you, you want it to drive you to, to gratitude. Uh, so don't just ignore that. But I hope you can be grateful uh, this weekend. Last week I started a sermon series. I'm calling it Interrogated. And I'm taking a look at, at some of the questions that, G, that people asked Jesus. They asked him really hard questions. And a, a lot of these questions were asked him right before he died. Just a few days before his death. So last week we talked about this question of where does your authority come from. Next week we're going to have an important lesson about the resurrection. What, what happens to relationships uh, in the next life. Jesus had a lot to say about that. We'll talk about that next week. And then two weeks from today, we'll talk about what Jesus said in response to that question, what are the greatest commands? Uh, but today, uh, we're going to talk about a, a question that people ask Jesus in regards to the wonderful subject of politics. So w- what I want you to do is I want you to think about six months ago, right in the middle of election season in our country, how many of you really enjoyed that season? <laughs> okay. How many of you were thrilled that it was over when it was over? Okay. Okay. Anybody like intentionally create conflict with other people? Just like you like bringing it up. We have any instigators in here? Okay. A few. That's good. That's, just, that's good to be aware of those things. It was amazing the way this affected our country. In fact, just last week, this will be probably another sermon, but I had coffee last week with This isn't even a member. This is a guest that's been coming a lot. And he told me that the election led him back to God this past fall. I was like, whoa, are you lying? Like, this is crazy. But I'll have to tell you his story in another sermon. But but for the most part, it was it was tense. In fact, I'll tell you about two of my friends. I've got a friend named Sam and a friend named Sarah. I'll just call him Sam and Sarah. Uh, Sarah, she's as far right as you can get on the political spectrum. She uh, she's a delegate in her community. She campaigns for whatever a candidate is on the right. Well, then I've got a friend named Sam, and he's the opposite. He's just as far left as you can get. In fact, so uh, a little while ago, Sam decided to run for, for political office on the, on the most left agenda possible, kind of on a local, uh, for a local office. Well, Sarah did not like this. And the one thing I forgot to mention to you is that they're actually in the same family. So, this is a true story. Sarah is Sam's mother-in-law. And so, yes, in the same family, she's campaigning for the people on the right. He is running as a member of the party on the left. And there would be moments where Sam would ask Sarah, hey, like, can you babysit my kids so I can go to this political event or that political event? So, imagine the, the tension in that family. And that's just a microcosm for what we, we all, we all experience this. My guess is you, you had some really hard conversations last fall and maybe didn't know exactly what to say. I heard of another family that they actually put a piece of paper out uh, at Thanksgiving and the piece of paper said, talk about everything but politics. And they put that on the mantle of the door as people walked in uh, for that meal. It, it, was, it was tense. Everybody had to deal with it. In fact, some of you, even still right now, there's like people in your family, you don't know how to talk to them. Like you don't know how to bring it up, you avoid it because you just, you just don't want to go there. There, there are some people, like maybe someone posted something on social media, even recently, and you, you just don't know what to say. You don't know what to do. It's hard, it's hard to know how to navigate the political landscape as a Christian. And so the question that I want to wrestle with for just a few minutes today is, is this. How, how does a Christian engage politics? Like how do, we, how do we do this maybe better just collectively than we have in the last few months? And I'll just say at the beginning here, this is just my opinion based on my interpretation of the text I'm about to read to you this morning. So I want you to view this as just a conversation starter, uh, not as anything other than that. So open your Bibles to Mark chapter 12. These, uh, 
group, two groups of people, the Pharisees and the Herodians, they come up to Jesus and they ask him a really important question. So here's what they say, Mark chapter 12, verse 13. Later, they sent some of the Pharisees and Herodians to Jesus to catch him in his words. They came to him and said, Teacher, we know that you are a man of integrity. You're not swayed by others because you pay no attention to who they are. But you teach the way of God in accordance with the truth. Like, this is a, like a great compliment there. It's like the greatest false sincerity I've ever heard. They don't believe any of this. They're just saying this to butter Jesus up. And then they get to the chase. Is it right to pay the imperial tax to Caesar or not? Should we pay or shouldn't we? And so they, they put this question right in front of Jesus. And it's a really good question because it, this was like their hot topic of their day. You know, this is, this is immigration, this is abortion, this is gay marriage. This is the question in their day that caused people to really just like, just get the blood under the skin kind of pumping a little, a little bit more. And the reason this question was so volatile back then is because on the one hand, the Jews hated this tax. They didn't want to pay it. And it wasn't because the tax was necessarily expensive. It was, it was one denarius, which in today's wages is about 50 bucks. And they had to pay that once a year. That's not a lot of money. The reason they hated it so much is because of what it symbolized. So every, every year they had to do the census and they had to march to their city and they had to pay this denarius. And what it symbolized was that we have to pay to live in the land that we know that God owns. So every year, this, uh, this was a reminder, this tax, that you are ruled by Caesar. And in fact, for a Jew, what they would say is that when the new king came, as was prophesied in the Old Testament, this new messianic figure, one of the signs that they would know this really was the king is that this person would make sure that the tax wasn't going to be paid anymore. They knew that the kingdom of God would not arrive until they, or, or they knew the kingdom of God would arrive the moment they could stop paying this tax, they hated it. So if Jesus were to say, yeah, guys, uh, let's just go ahead and pay our taxes, the Jews are immediately going to think, well, you're not the king. You're not the Messiah. But on the other hand, if Jesus says, no, nah, don't, don't pay it, whatever, you don't need to pay your taxes, then there's a whole other set of consequences. In fact, there's this throwaway verse in Acts chapter 5, verse 37 where we learn about some history. So if you put this on the screen, Judas the Galilean appeared in the days of the census and led a band of people in revolt. He was killed. This was an event that happened about 25 years before Jesus came, came onto the scene. And so this man named Judas was one of the first leaders of a group of people that we now know as the Zealots. These are the group of people that they fought violence with violence. They didn't like Rome, and so they wanted to fight back. Well, one of the reasons that Judas was killed is because he told all the Jews, stop paying this imperial tax. And so the Romans, when they heard about that, they, come in and said, well, wait, they came in and said, well, this is unacceptable. We're going to kill Judas, and then his revolt is going to end. And so guess what's going to happen to Jesus if he says, yeah, don't, don't pay the tax? Well, the Romans are going to come in and do the exact same thing to him. So this is why the question is so good. Because if Jesus says, yeah, you should pay the tax, then the Jews are going to think he's a fraud, but if he says, no, don't pay the tax, then the Romans are going to come in and kill him. So which would you rather pick, be a fraud or, or be dead? And so for the, for the Pharisees and the Herodians, this is a great question because Jesus, he's either going to lose his influence or he's going to lose his life. They have him cornered in the hot seat. Well, here's what Jesus says in response to this really good question. Verse 15, Jesus knew their hypocrisy and so he said this, Why are you trying to trap me? He asked. Bring me a denarius and let me look at it. So they brought him a coin and he asked them, Whose image is this and whose inscription? Caesar's, they replied. Then Jesus said to them, Okay, the give back to Caesar what is Caesar's and give to God what is God's. It's a really short statement. But in that statement, we know what the politics of Jesus are. Now, we got to really think about this text to really figure that out. And so really the first clue here to figure out what exactly is Jesus saying in response to this hard question is you got you to realize what was on this coin that he asked them to produce. So this is a denarius. It's got the image of Caesar, and the inscription would be translated as son of the divine. Caesar Augustus, son of the divine. And so already you can imagine in this story what you have is a contrast already being built. 
You have Jesus Christ who claims to be the king and claims to be the son of God standing next to this coin who has Caesar who's now claiming to be the king and claiming to be the son of God. So immediately you can see that there's somewhat of a contrast going on in this story between the kingdom of God and the kingdom of Caesar. Now, image, inscription. Why, why does Jesus highlight those two things? Well, there's a reason. I'll explain it by, by showing you this Bible. I went to the lost and found this morning, which is just behind those steps right in front of me, and I got a Bible out of the lost and found. Now, if I want to know who owns this Bible, I'm going to look for two things. I'm going to look for inscription, and I'm going to look for image. In fact, so I found some images. I'm sure you can't see this from where you are, but I've got lovely little stickers uh, here uh, stuck in this Bible. So who, what kind of person would you guess owns this Bible? It, it's a child, because image is a sign of ownership. And then you can go to the front of the Bible, and it actually says, uh, this is somebody named Zane. I don't know the last name, but this might be your Bible, so you can come and get it after service. So image and inscription, they point to ownership. That was the, that was the idea behind this coin. Okay, Caesar's image is on the coin. Okay, the coin belongs to Caesar. So give Caesar that which bears his image, is what Jesus is saying. Okay, he owns the coins, give him his coins. Well, then the question is, what... Or who bears the image of God? Well, all the Jews in their time would have known this. And if you're a Christian, you know this from Genesis 1. God said, see if you can finish this off for me. Let us make man in our image. Every person is fashioned from the image of God. And so what Jesus is saying here is he's saying, okay, Caesar owns the coins, give Caesar the coins. But God owns yourself. So give God your entire sense of being. In fact, just a few verses later, Jesus is going to start talking about the greatest commands. And this is the point where he says, love the God with all of your heart and your soul and your mind and your strength. And the reason he's saying love God with all those things is because they come from God. So he's saying give back everything that belongs to God. And so Jesus is making a radical case here about comparison between the kingdom of Caesar and the kingdom of God. So which kingdom would be more valuable? The kingdom that owns the coins? Or is it the kingdom that owns the world? You see, Jesus is saying something here that people didn't like back then. And my guess is there, there's going to be people that don't like this today. And what Jesus is really saying is that the kingdom of God will always trump... No, let me re rephrase that. That's... Let, <laughs> The kingdom of God will always supersede. Don't want, to get, don't want to get a little controversial here. The kingdom of God is going to supersede the politics of people. That's what he's saying in this story. You've got a coin. Caesar owns the coins. Okay, give them to God. But your whole being, or give that to Caesar. Your whole being, give that to God. Jesus is making a statement about hierarchy between kingdom of God and politics of the people. That if you're looking for a place in Scripture where Jesus says this really simply, just go to the Sermon on the Mount. Right in the heart of that sermon, Matthew 6, Jesus says, seek first his kingdom. That is a statement about priorities. Seek first the kingdom of God, not the politics of the people. In fact, so if you want to blow this up to a little bit bigger of a picture, what Jesus is doing in this political tense conversation is he's actually fulfilling what Daniel said would happen in the Old Testament. So going back to the book of Daniel, Nebuchadnezzar has a dream. And Daniel interprets this dream. And if you remember, if you throw this image up there, the dream is of this statue. And each part of the statue represents a different kingdom. And we're talking big, powerful kingdoms. Like Rome and like Assyria and like Babylon. In fact, those kingdoms owned a greater amount of the world like percentage-wise, than the United States of America controls and owns today. These are huge, big, powerful kingdoms. And if you remember the, this dream, Nebuchadnezzar has it, and at the end, this big rock comes into the dream and it destroys this statue. And Daniel comes along, and here's what he says about the interpretation, if you put this on the screen. Daniel says, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that will never be destroyed. It will crush it will crush all those kingdoms and bring them to an end, but it will endure forever. And so what Jesus is saying here now in this political debate is this is happening. My kingdom 
is coming right now through me, and it's going to be around forever. The reason Jesus was so passionate about the kingdom of God is because the kingdom of God is the only order, the only social system that will last forever. And so he is making a bold, powerful case about the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God will always supersede the politics of the people. And perhaps one of the reasons I really like this particular dialogue between Jesus and this group of people is that Jesus doesn't choose a side which they're wanting him to do. Instead, what Jesus does is he offers a vision. He offers a vision of something totally different and totally better. In fact, just to to help you understand what this vision that Jesus is offering, think about the phrase, give to God what is God's. What would a society look like if that was their only law? We're going to give to God what belongs to God. Well, I've got my time, but I I, I guess my time doesn't really belong to me, so I guess I'm going to spend that serving other people. I've got a home, but that doesn't really belong to me. That belongs to God, so I guess I'm going to be inviting people in all the time to share my home. I've got possessions. Oh, those don't belong to me either. Those are God's. I guess I'm going to give my possessions away. I've got food. Oh, that doesn't belong to me either. I guess I'm going to share my food with other people. Do you realize what that sounds like? A group of people that were to give their time back to God and others and and to give their homes away and their food away and their possessions away. Do you realize what that sounds like? That sounds exactly like the church. They were practicing that very principle two months after Jesus said this. And see, what is often overlooked when we try to figure out what exactly were the politics of Jesus, we often overlook the most glaringly obvious entity, the church. You have to look at the church when you're going to look at the politics of Jesus. And here's why. Jesus comes to this earth. He has a mission to defeat death, to defeat sin, to give us hope of eternal life. And so he spends his whole life launching this kingdom of God, and then he dies, and and then he raises from the dead. And then what is the one thing that Jesus left behind? He didn't leave behind a political party. Jesus left behind the church. With the audacious claim that not even hell itself would be able to take down the church. And so understand what Jesus is doing, not just through this conversation with the Herodians and the Pharisees, but through his whole ministry. What Jesus is doing is he's not taking sides. He's taking over. He's saying, I'm bringing about the kingdom of God, the new reality in which the rule and reign of God will come from heaven to earth through this new, amazing, peculiar group of people that I'm going to call the church. And it's this group of people which is going to forward justice and mercy and love to the world. It is this group of people through which my mission will be accomplished in this world. Jesus didn't leave a political party. He left the church. And so what that means is that the hope of the world does not rest in the hands of politicians. The hope of the world rests in the heart of the local church. In fact, after after first service, I stood down there at the front and I shook hands with Ray Vaughn, who is a political, he's in politics. He he works in politics and he gave me a big smile. I thought he was going to like hate this sermon. He gave me a big smile and he was like, you're right. We've got to carry out our mission through the kingdom of God, not the politics of the people, though, though they are important. And I know there's lots of issues that, that, are, that are a big deal today, and we've got to talk about them. I'm not saying don't talk about the issues. We've got to talk about health care, and we've got to talk about immigration, and all the things that we talk about in politics. Yes, they are important, they are valuable, but please remember, it is not the government's job to carry out the mission of the church. It's the church's job to carry out the mission of the church. And so again, don't, don't hear what I'm not saying. I'm, I'm not saying that politics aren't important. In fact, I'll say this. In my opinion, I would say Jesus would say, or he didn't say this explicitly, but what I think he means here is I, I don't think he would say to ignore politics. I, I don't think he would advocate for a position of drastic disengagement. And the reason I say that is because there was a group in the first century that did that. They were called the Essenes, and they were so 
disgruntled with all the political stuff going on and all the violence of the Roman Empire that they just like left. They just walked over to some caves, built their own little community, hung out there. It's where we got the Dead Sea Scrolls. But Jesus never really advocated for that kind of a position. Jesus was engaged in politics. He was born while his parents were paying the tax. They were, they were going through the census when Jesus was born. Jesus knew the issues of his day. He, he would go and talk to Pilate about things, even in this very story. Again, Jesus doesn't say, yeah, don't pay your taxes at all, like Judas had said 25 years ago when he died. So Jesus would not say, totally ignore politics. Jesus did not boycott the government. But Jesus didn't worship politics either. And you might ask yourself this question, where do you fall on this continuum? Ignoring politics or worshiping them? Because what I've discovered is that people on the extremes of that continuum both carry the same quality, which is arrogance. People who just ignore it altogether carry themselves with this, well, I'm better than you because I don't care about what's going on in politics. And that's the same aura that people carry themselves with on the opposite end when they think, I've got my ideas, I've got my agenda, I know I'm right. It's, it's arrogant. And what Jesus is saying, don't, don't ignore politics, don't worship politics, rather use your politics to advance the ultimate reality, which again, it's the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God will always supersede the politics of the people. In fact, you might think about it this way. So, are you more passionate about the news or the good news? Meaning like when you turn your TV on tonight and you've got Fox News on, you've got CNN on, or you're reading through your news feed on your tablet, what gets you going? Is it the news or is it like the good news as in the gospel? Now again, I'm not saying don't advocate for what you believe in politically, but, but all I'm saying is that there does come a point in which we spend so much of our energy and emotion dumping into our political platform that we have nothing left to go tell our neighbor about Jesus. And we have nothing left to serve the poor. And when that happens, what does that say about your life? If the gospel of Jesus is not at the center of your heart, then your heart's not centered on the gospel. So yes, use your politics for the kingdom of God, but just remember that the ultimate reality is God's kingdom. That's what Jesus left when he went back to heaven. He, he left the church. In fact, I was reminded of the centrality of the kingdom of God when I, I listened to this sermon from 1970. It was at this uh, missionary conference by a guy named Tom Skinner, and he was comparing Barabbas to Jesus. And I really liked what he said, so, so I want you to hear at least one excerpt from this, from this sermon. So remember, right before Jesus died, Pilate came before the group, uh, the crowd, and said, hey, I'll release to you a prisoner. You can have Barabbas, or you can have Jesus. Now, both were revolutionists. They were both trying to change the world through very different means. And so here's what, what Tom said in this sermon from 1970. If you let Barabbas go, you can always stop him. The most Barabbas is going to do is round up a bunch of another bunch of guerrillas and start another riot. And you will always stop him by bringing out the National Guard and putting down his riot. Find out where he's keeping his ammunition. Raid his apartment without a search warrant. Shoot him while he's in his sleep. You can always stop Barabbas. But how do you stop Jesus? They took and nailed him to a cross, buried him, rolled a stone over his grave, wiped their hands and said, that is one radical who will never disturb us again. We've gotten rid of him. We will never hear any more of his words of revolution. But then three days later, Jesus Christ pulled off one of the greatest political coups of all time. He got up out of the grave. He was the leader of a new creation, a Christ who has come to overthrow the existing order and to establish a new order that is not built on man. All systems of men will crumble and finally only God's kingdom and his righteousness will prevail. Think again back to Nebuchadnezzar's dream. The kingdom of God is the ultimate reality. That's what Jesus came to start. So the sermon ends by saying this. So become part of the new order. And then go into a world that's enslaved. A world that's filled with hunger and poverty and racism. And all those things that are works of the devil. 
Go into the world and tell men who are bound mentally, spiritually, and physically the liberator has come. So what's he saying here? He's saying the same thing that Jesus was saying in Mark 12, which is simply this. The kingdom of God is always going to supersede the politics of the people. And the reason is because it is fueled by the power of resurrection. We worship a Lord who defeated death. Therefore, what Jesus built, the church, is indestructible. Because it is also fueled by the same power of resurrection, which is not what any government in the world runs on. Governments of the world run on power. Churches run on the power of love. And that is why the kingdom of God will always outlast any kingdom that men will ever build. Now, again, don't, don't hear me wrong here. In my opinion, our democracy is the greatest form of government in the world. This, this is just my opinion. Politics are important. Don't hear me say that politics are not important. They are. I think our democracy is a great form of government. In fact, if you travel to other cu countries and just, just witnessed how, how their economics work or, or how their judicial systems work, then you come back to the United States of America and you're very grateful. I'm thankful for our democracy. To be honest, I'm really thankful for our Constitution. Other than the Bible, it, it is perhaps one of the, at least one of the greatest documents ever written. It has created a very, very stable society. I, I love, I love our Constitution. I love the faith of our, our, our founders that built this country. I love this country. All I'm saying is that as a minister, as someone who has walked with people in pain, I have never had a moment in my entire ministry career where I've gone to the hospital when someone's at like the worst moment of their life. I've never had someone say, Phil, will you just like read the Bill of Rights to me? Like I've never had anybody say that. When people get to like the big moments of life, you know what they want? They want the Word of God and they want the people of God. Because those are the grounding realities of our life. It's the Bible and it's the church. And so all I'm saying, politics are important. But when I read Mark 12, all, all I can say is that the kingdom of God will always supersede the politics of the people. Now, I'll make one more observation from, from this text and then, then I'll be done. But here's the, the, the other truth that, that I would give to you this morning. It's this. Be careful about registering Jesus. And I'll explain what I mean by this. When I was reading Mark 12 and kind of reading the background of this text, one thing really stood out to me that I never knew. The two groups of people that confronted Jesus were the Pharisees and the Herodians. And guess what? Those two groups were on opposite sides of the political spectrum. And they united in one moment to take down Jesus because they hated him so much. So for the Herodians, they'll be, they'll be over here on this side of the political spectrum. Their name says it all. The Herodians love Herod. And so the Herodians are totally fine with Roman rule. They, they love that Caesar is in control. They love that, that the Romans are instilling their values into Israel's national identity. The Herodians are fine with Herod. The Pharisees hate Roman rule. They don't want to pay their taxes to Caesar. They don't like Herod. In fact, these two groups of people would be in vigorous political debate about this very subject. And so what they're really trying to get Jesus to do, again, Jesus is in the hot seat, all they want Jesus to do is just pick a side. All he needs to do is pick one side or the other, and they know that Jesus will be discredited. But Jesus does something totally different. Again, remember, Jesus didn't come to take sides. Jesus came to take over. And so what Jesus does is he doesn't, he doesn't paint himself in a political party. He doesn't do it. And so why do we try to do to Jesus what Jesus won't even do to himself? I mean, I'm sure you're aware of this, but I'll, I'll just say it. At least this is my opinion. Everybody assumes that Jesus would agree with their political position. I mean, did you know that? Everybody thinks that. Everybody. I mean, so if you, if you identify as someone on, on the right, then most likely your argument is going to be, well, the, the Bible's right. God's right. So therefore, 
like Jesus, he'd be on the right, of course. The Bible's right, God's right, you know, Jesus is going to be on the right. And if you're on the left, I love how Andy Stanley put this. I heard him say this the other day. If you're on the left, then you're going to argue for your faith in politics, and you're going to say something like, well, well, Jesus was like a healthcare dispensing machine. And so clearly, Jesus would, Jesus would be on the left. And you would have, you could, I'm sure you could argue all day long about the fact that you know in your bones Jesus would agree with you. On a serious note, let me just tell you, six months ago when the election was happening, so interesting to walk through that as the preacher at this church who loves, deeply loves every person in this room. Before the election, I had so many people come up to me and say some version of Phil, there is no way any Christian with a brain in their head could ever vote for her. And then in the few days after the election, I had so many people come up to me and say, Phil, how in the world could any Christian with a brain in their head have ever voted for him? And you guys are sitting in the same room. Like, you're sitting in the same room together. Like, I had, I had this one guy I really remember. He was in tears. He was so upset after the election. He thought about moving because he couldn't imagine that a Christian could put that man in the office. And again, same thing on, on the other side. So many people thought, how in the world could a Christian put her into office? Again, the reality is Jesus didn't put himself in a political party. And so when we try to do that, we're doing something to Jesus that Jesus didn't do to himself. And so all I'm saying is based on this story, be careful about registering Jesus. In fact, uh, this past week I was thinking quite a bit about Democrats and Republicans and really wrestling with what, what would Jesus do in this environment. You can throw these two uh, just rectangles representing those two parties on the screen. You know, what would Jesus be? Red? Would he be red? Would he be blue? And so I was really thinking about this, but then I thought, well, we can't just talk about the United States of America. I mean, Canada's got like five, you know, political parties and so i thought well maybe jesus would pick one of those canada's got five and then i thought if we're talking about canada you can't leave mexico out and they've got like 11 or 12 so like there's so many political parties to to even pick from and then i thought well, okay well john 3 16 says that god so loved the whole world so we should probably think about the world and so you might be interested to know this the cia website <laughs> lists every political party on earth every political party you know how many squares are on the screen there's 581 squares on the screen. That's only one-fourth of the world. That has to go on the screen four times to represent the actual number, which is 2,326 political parties on planet Earth. So basically, when you think about our congregation, that's basically our attendance. So every person in here represents one political party on the face of the planet. So for anybody to say... Well, I'm 100% convinced that Jesus Christ is in this political party. I mean, are you starting to see a little bit of the arrogance of that statement? You see, the reality is of the 2,326 political parties on earth right now, there is not one of them that is identical to the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God will always supersede the politics of the people. In fact, so at the very end of the Bible, Revelation chapter 7, we get this glimpse into heaven. And I want to read, read you what's going on in heaven. The God of heaven. Nope, that's Daniel. Where's Revelation? There's, here's Revelation. After this I looked, and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count. And read this next part with me. That no one could count from every nation, tribe, people, and language. Okay, you could pause there. Every tribe, every people, every nation, every language. Like, what's a tribe? A tribe is a subset of a nation. What is a political party? A political party is a subset of a nation. And when we get this glimpse into heaven, they're all standing there. All peoples, all languages, all tribes. Like when you get to heaven in this moment, the diversity that you will witness is going to be astounding. It'll be more than you ever thought. And what are these people doing? 
We'll read the verse. They're standing, or I'll read the verse. Standing before the throne and before the Lamb, they were wearing white robes and were holding palm branches in their hands. And they cried out in a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God. Not your God, not my God, not his God, not her God. Our God. Who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. And they've washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. So regardless of your political position today, you got to realize that on Judgment Day, the question that you will be asked is not, were you red or blue? The question will be, are your robes white because they've been washed in the blood of Jesus? On that day, everybody's going to be praising the name of the real king in heaven. You know how you get your robes washed white? Well, you join the family of God. And you do that by getting baptized. And so as we close here, if that's something that you want to do today, we want to give you the opportunity to do that. If there's anything that this church family can do for you, we invite you to come while we stand and sing.